I'm Eleanor Wachtel, and this is Writers and Company. Today, dissident intellectual and world-famous linguist Noam Chomsky. Described as a latter-day Copernicus, Chomsky has turned around the way we think about language and about political discourse in democracies. The most frequently quoted praise of Noam Chomsky originates in the New York Times Book Review. It says, Noam Chomsky is arguably the most important intellectual alive today. These words appear on the dust jackets of Chomsky's books, and they're mentioned whenever reporters talk about Chomsky's political activism. The irony is that for Chomsky, the New York Times is one of the major perpetrators of what he calls a web of deceit, or thought control in a democratic society. The story goes that Chomsky's dentist noticed that he'd been grinding his teeth. His wife observed that it wasn't happening at night when he was asleep. Eventually, they figured out it was occurring every morning when Chomsky reads the New York Times. Noam Chomsky is an iconoclast and an assiduous gadfly of power. He speaks for no particular ideology, and no party claims him. Despite his fierce critique of American foreign policy during the Cold War, he was no favorite of the Soviet Union either. His works, even his scholarly writings on linguistics, were banned there. In Chomsky's view, the responsibility of intellectuals is to speak the truth and expose lies. He said that more than 25 years ago, and he still believes it today. The Oxford Companion to the English Language says that Chomsky is considered to be the most influential figure in linguistics in the later 20th century. In the late 50s and 60s, Chomsky argued that humans have an innate capacity to learn language, a kind of deep grammar that is bred in the bone and is part of our genetic makeup. A fundamental element of being human, he said, is the ability to create language. The impact of his work was so great, it's been dubbed the Chomskyan Revolution. According to the Citation Index in the Arts and Humanities and the Social Sciences, Chomsky is the most cited living author, and he ranks eighth if you include living and dead writers, beating out Hegel and Cicero. Noam Chomsky is 65 years old, and he maintains a daunting schedule. He spends several days a week on the road lecturing, 20 hours a week answering mail, plus his day job as a professor of linguistics at MIT. He produces about a book a year. I estimated 45 titles, and he said he didn't know for sure. I talked to Noam Chomsky from National Public Radio Station WGBH in Boston. The picture that I have is of a really tireless, dedicated, and even ascetic life. And, and a long time ago, that's how Norman Mailer described you after sharing a jail cell briefly <laughs> because of a Vietnam War protest. He used the word ascetic. How does that word sit with you? It's more or less accurate, I guess, although, you know, I do plenty of things to, uh, that are quite totally self-indulgent, uh, even thing increasing now that I have grandchildren. Can, can you give me an example of a self-indulgent? Playing with my grandchildren, for example. That's, that's the maximum of self-indulgence. Is that it? <laughs> I was waiting for something a little richer, you know. Richer? Well, well you know, uh, over the summer we... Uh, I, I go into total hermitude over the summer. The only way I've been able, to, I've discovered over the years that the only way I can survive this uh, schedule from beginning of September through the end of June is to uh, disappear entirely over the summer and, you know, barely answer the telephone, uh, see a couple of old friends and family comes by and that sort of thing. Uh, and uh, then uh, I, I work most of, the, my wife and I both work most of the day, but we you know, we'll take off in the late afternoon and go swimming or, ha or go sailing, have a sailboat out there, that sort of thing. That's so, even during the summer, you'll be working most of the day? Uh, yeah, most of the day. <laughs> you once said that it's not unlikely that literature will forever give far deeper insight into what is sometimes called the, the full human person than any modes of scientific inquiry may, may hope to do. And yet you rarely refer to works of the imagination. How have you been influenced by fiction? Um, well, that's hard to say. I, I, I read a lot of fiction. I read a lot more when I was younger. Uh, I do actually refer to it now and then, but it's, uh, it creates one's sensibility in ways that are hard to explain. Uh, uh, understanding of people and what they do and, uh, 
uh, enriches one, one's intuition in particular ways. I find it hard to point to. When you read fiction, what do you turn to? What do I turn to? I have fairly conservative tastes, uh, usually uh, um, 19th, early 20th century literature, uh, sometimes modern things. I, I was struck, and maybe just the, the sort of the nature of the, of the world that I move in, which is, is more literary, and I was struck by a sentence that you said about how you'd always been resistant, consciously resistant to allowing literature to influence your beliefs and attitudes. Hmm. Insofar as I can. So, for example, I would not like not just literature, but uh, the visual arts, uh, uh, documentaries, and so on. Uh, I, it, it, uh, it's one thing to have your... Uh, uh, your imagination uh, stimulated and heightened and so on. It's another thing to find the truth. Uh, and to the one can't get out of one's skin, naturally. But uh, to the extent that self-awareness and self-criticism allows, I would try to put to the side uh, uh, intuitive feelings, uh, emotional reactions, uh, perspectives that uh, are not determined by the evidence itself, uh, that's uh, 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 obviously an unattainable ideal, and I don't uh, claim to attain it, and I don't even know to the extent to which I try, but uh, at least one, one ought to try. As a normative principle, I think it's a good one. Noam Chomsky, I'd like to get at the origin of your sense of justice, your, your sympathy for the underdog. Uh, the origin, like the origin of my life, or in its, uh, uh, the origin of my life comes from uh, having grown up in the Depression, I suppose, and uh, our early childhood memories being uh, uh, people coming to the door and trying to sell rags or apples uh, or something like that, uh, uh, driving in a, coming, uh, traveling in a trolley car past. Uh, a textile factory where women are on strike and watching a, a police riot where they, you know, beat the strikers and uh, and then on to uh, the experience that isn't immediate, the, the kind of experience that comes from reading from uh, uh, from film, uh, from secondary sources, uh, plus plenty of personal experience. There's. Uh, there's an, uh, 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 from another point of view, it just comes from the assumption that uh, human beings have uh, fundamental intrinsic rights, uh, which are infringed upon in, uh, in numerous ways, uh, uh, le leading to uh, sometimes grievous injustice right before our eyes, uh, and a particular concern to the extent that we ourselves, I myself, let's say, am involved in it. So I'm much more concerned about... Uh, crimes committed, say, by the United States, where I have some degree of responsibility, than for the crimes of Genghis Khan. I can get upset about those, but I can't do much about them. What effect do you think it had on you to grow up in a neighborhood in Philadelphia that, that was uh, pro-Nazi during the early days mm. of the war? Yeah, that was kind of frightening. I was, uh, we were, the only, for a large part of my childhood, the only Jewish family in a neighborhood that was uh, mainly German and Irish Catholic. Uh, very anti-Semitic. Uh, most of the kids went to Catholic school. In fact, I should say that until I was well past the age of reason, I still had a kind of a visceral fear of Catholics and Catholic schools. Uh, it was hard to overcome when I met people like, say, the Berrigans and others, although I knew it was irrational. Uh, the, the neighborhood was pro-Nazi. This was the 1930s. Uh, and uh, I recall uh, celebrations when Paris fell, uh, my brother and I knew that we had uh, particular paths that we could take, uh, not others, to you know get to the bus or to the store or whatever. Uh, I don't want to exaggerate that either. I mean, the anti-Semitism was real, but you could still play with the kids, you know, or uh, you never knew what was going to happen next. But so there's a little wariness, but uh, some to some extent part of the neighborhood. Uh, that was always in the background, and then of course the what was I was the uh, what was happening in, in Europe was very frightening. I mean, I can remember uh, uh, listening to uh, uh, Hitler's Nuremberg rallies, not really understanding, but uh, understanding my parents' reactions. Uh, and then by the time I was, say, uh, 
you know, eight or nine or ten or able to understand what was happening in the world to some extent, uh, watching one part of Europe after another fall to Hitlerism, uh, I was, that, that was frightening. Especially when right nearby me and ar uh, around me, I could see uh, resonances of it. You've said that your anarchist interests go way back to early childhood. Hmm. How did that come about? I, I find it hard I, to picture a early child. I mean, you know, a young a young kid and uh, having a grasp of that or an affinity to that. Well, I was very. This is the 1930s, remember, which was a very lively, exciting period with uh, uh, lots of uh, political debate and discussion. A lot, a lot of, although it was deep depression, lots of hope for the future. My family was large part of it was unemployed uh, working class but though there was the poverty objectively speaking was uh, worse than uh, unemployment was certainly much worse than anything we have nevertheless there was a sense of hopefulness and discussion and debate and work and uh, I, I grew up in the midst of that and became very much involved and interested in all these issues and by the time I was old enough to uh, sort of act on my own at all I uh, I was uh, frequenting uh, Fourth Avenue bookstores uh, uh, in New York, uh, anarchist offices, uh, picking up literature, talking to people uh, or members of uh, relatives who were involved in these uh, movements and concerns were important later, older other people I met. met. Uh, the Spanish Civil War was one event that really caught my interest uh, enormously. I uh, uh, actually, uh, I guess the first article I wrote or can remember writing was uh, right after the fall of Barcelona. Uh, and a year or two later, I was beginning to pick up uh, anarchist pamphlets and literature and uh, think about what had happened then. The uh, uh, and and what it meant. And those interests and concerns simply never changed. I mean, my, my own greatest political involvement at that time was uh, uh, with re within what was then Palestine, what became Israel later. This is early 1940s. Uh, I was, uh, my, I grew up in a, fam in a virtual ghetto, I suppose. My, my family were, uh, the, my, my parents were both deeply, uh, uh, they lived primarily in a, in a Jewish environment, a Jewish sort of first generation immigrant environment. They were both Hebrew teachers. And the, the important thing in life was uh, the revival of Hebrew culture, the, uh, uh, the cultural revival of, in Palestine. Uh, the, uh, I would read Hebrew literature with my father from childhood, uh, 19th and 20th century Hebrew literature, and older sources, of course. Uh, uh, I spent my time in Hebrew school, later became a Hebrew teacher, and out of all of this came a very, uh, uh, connected with my political interest, this naturally converged to an interest in Zionism, and I was, at, at that time, uh, uh, committed to a uh, a wing of the Zionist movement, which was sig still significant in the 1940s, which was opposed to a Jewish state, though it was considered part of the, a live part of the Zionist movement, and was concerned with uh, the possibility of uh, Arab-Jewish cooperation in a, uh, uh, a framework of cooperative uh, socialist institutions and so on. Uh, I never actually joined anything. I wasn't much of a joiner, and the actual movements that were involved in these things, I was, I couldn't, I, I was associated with them, but I could never join them because they were all either Stalinist or Trotskyist, and I was very anti-Leninist already at that time, anti-Marxist, in fact. And so I, while I agreed with them about lots of things, I could never uh, really become a member. I did actually live on a, a, uh, a, a kibbutz uh, from uh, those groups uh, some years later for several uh, uh, for a brief period in fact thought of staying there but joining was an impossibility because of my anarchist commitments these anarchist commitments going back to such a young age I mean the fall of Barcelona writing this piece for the uh, the school newspaper when you were 10 saying that from the time you were 
around that age, around 12 or 13, that your views hadn't really changed that much. What What is, I mean, obviously they've gotten more sophisticated, but what does that say about you, that your views would be so firmly fixed at such a young age? Mm. Maybe it means that I'm obtuse. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it's a matter of uh, seeing that something's right and just sticking to it and trying to understand. I mean, I think that those are the right ideas. I, when I think about uh, human nature and human fulfillment and self-realization, uh, it seems to me that the intellectual tradition that led to modern anarchism and that includes, incidentally, the mainstream of classical liberalism, which in my view is very much misinterpreted. By that I mean uh, Adam Smith, uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, who inspired Mill, uh, the libertarian side of Rousseau. Rousseau is sort of complex, but there is a libertarian side. And that developed into the classical liberal tradition, which was then seriously aborted, in my opinion, by the rise of industrial capitalism. Uh, that tradition... Uh, uh, I think, uh, is, a, uh, uh, is a very valid one. It leads to uh, modern libertarian socialism or uh, parts of the anarchist tradition. And I think that uh, they, they, it's, it's basically a, a sense that uh, human beings have a fundamental right to uh, uh, self-realization, self-fulfillment under conditions of freedom and voluntary association. Uh, the classical liberals like Humboldt uh, did not want, they were not uh, individualists in the primitive style of Rousseau, but uh, uh, so as Humboldt put it, he wanted to remove the fetters from human society, but to increase the bonds, uh, these being bonds of voluntary self-association. Uh, classical liberalism in this form had uh, uh, was sharply critical of property values, uh, so, for example, Humboldt argued again, again that uh, the worker who uh, cultivates a, a garden is more its owner than the uh, 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 the uh, person who uh, simply enjoys the fruits of the other's labor but may technically own it. Uh, Adam Smith's anti-capitalism derives from the same roots, uh, a and, and he was in many ways anti-capitalist. His recognition that... Uh, a division of labor is ultimately intolerable because it will uh, turn every human being into something as stupid and ignorant as it is possible for a creature to be, therefore, thereby undermining the essence of human nature, uh, which is the right to create freely and constructively under one's own control and without uh, external constraints. Out of this comes a conception of... Uh, freedom and rights and social organization, which places any form of authority and domination under challenge, uh, asks that it justify itself. Uh, sometimes such justifications can be given, maybe under contingent historical circumstances or maybe more deeply, but uh, the burden of proof is on the system of authority and do domination. Quite typically, that burden can't be met, in which case one will try to work with others to uh, overcome that those structures of authority and domination and to increase positive freedom, freedom not simply in the sense of uh, removal of, say, state controls, but freedom in the sense of forms of social organization that allow people to uh, realize their, their, their potential, their, uh, their, their need to be uh, uh, active, creative, uh, uh, to, uh, and, and, or whatever other aspects their personality may have. Have there been any societies where these ideals have been put into effect? Yeah, in every society to some extent. Uh, so, for example, in our society, to some extent, these ideals are realized. To other extents, in other respects, they're not. Uh, uh, what we seek, if we're honorable, in my opinion, is the respects in which they are not met, which are enormous. And those we try to confront and uh, uh, remove, remove those fetters, create new social bonds in Humboldt's terms. It's 30 years now since you made a decision to become an activist, to commit so much of your life to political action. It was 1964. You were a successful linguist. You had a family. Everything was sort of perfect. Have you ever looked back? Have you ever thought about the things that you had to give up? Oh, sure. Lots. Uh, it... Uh I knew right away. I mean, as as you had mentioned, as we've discussed, I, I didn't really change my views at that point. But I did decide that it was just intolerable to uh, 
sim- and uh, uh, t- intolerably self-indulgent merely to take a passive role in uh, uh, the struggles that were then going on. So signing petitions and you know sending money and uh, showing up now and then in a meeting and so on. Uh, I thought it was critically necessary to take a more active role, and I was well aware of what that would mean. It's not the kind of thing where you can put a foot in and then, you know, in the water and get it wet and then leave. You go in deeper and deeper. And I knew that I would be following a course that would uh, confront privilege and authority and would therefore be uh, my, my own views, which were indeed highly critical, but you know, didn't have much of an effect when I expressed my opinions in small groups or to, you know, or let's say refused to get clearance in the lab at MIT or something like that, uh, it would become uh, a much uh, a larger part of life uh, uh, and a damaging part as I proceeded. I have no illusions about the nature of the uh, intellectual community. Uh, it's conformism, it's uh, techniques for marginalizing or trying to uh, eliminate uh, uh, critical and independent thought. It's always been true, remains true, and I had a fair picture of where it was going. I uh, was unhappy about it. It means giving up lots of things, but felt it was necessary, and uh, what, there are what, many compensations. What, what sort of things did you give up, and what, what sort of damage would have did you have to endure? Well, you know, I, I live in a world in which... Uh, a world of constant uh, lies, vilification, uh, denunciation, uh, uh, also simply marginalization. Uh, and what I gave up is lots of uh, free time to work on things that I find really exciting, uh, as I do right now, uh, plus uh, just uh, other, you know, large parts of life just disappear. Um, so, for example, large parts of personal life simply disappear for plain physical reasons because a day has 24 hours. What pushed you over into that level of activism back then? It was a combination of what was happening in the civil rights movement and the uh, the growing uh, U.S. war in Vietnam, which by 1964 was very serious. And that it, I, I felt, I should say, completely hopeless about it at the time. Uh, I recall that in 1964 there was virtually no opposition to the war no organized opposition or vocal opposition. Uh, in fact, that didn't develop for years later. Uh, and it seemed to me highly unlikely that it would ever develop. Uh, what did develop a couple of years later came to me as a big surprise. And the early stages were by no means pleasant. So, for example, as late as, uh, take, say, Boston, which is where I live, which is quite liberal city, maybe the most liberal city in the country, uh, until uh, late 1966... That means when there were a couple hundred thousand American troops in South Vietnam and the U.S. had been bombing North Vietnam for uh, uh, regularly for then a year and a half. Until about then, it was virtually impossible to have a, uh, a public outdoor demonstration against the war in Boston. Even meetings in churches were attacked. They were just physically attacked. Uh, and that was even true of meetings in, in churches, I well remember, in early 1966 when public meetings in downtown churches were simply physically attacked, and that was considered right. Uh, So there was no protest against that by the liberal community. In fact, on the contrary, there was protest against these uh, uh, people who were daring to uh, question and criticize uh, American state power and its uh, its exercise. And that's pretty much what I expected. Uh, I also got involved very quickly in the resistance movement and... uh, felt that, anticipated that that would have uh, unpleasant consequences, like, for example, uh, years in jail, which was not remote at that time. Noam Chomsky in Boston. He's my guest today on Writers & Company on CBC Stereo and in the United States on the News and Information Station of Minnesota Public Radio. I'm Eleanor Wachtel. Now back to my conversation with linguist and political radical Noam Chomsky. You're sharply critical of American foreign policy everywhere in the world. I think that's probably even an understatement. I get the sense that it's not so much that the United States behaves badly because you recognize that all countries act out of self-interest. And if I can quote you, violence, deceit, and lawlessness are natural functions of the state, any state, 
-hmm. And given that the United States is such a big and powerful state, it only follows that it will do all that in spades. But what really seems to enrage you is the hypocrisy of the American system, that it claims to take a high road. Is that true? The hypocrisy of um, the political leadership doesn't particularly enrage me. I just take that for granted. But what I, I do, what, what, what I do find, uh, well, rage is the right word, I guess, and never get over this emotion, though I realize it's impropriety, is the way in which the uh, educated sectors uh, behave in the manner of a uh, commissar class. It's their deceit and distortion and subordination to power and unwillingness to uh, uh, face the realities in front of them that uh, uh, just from a, an aesthetic or emotional point of view, I find it hardest to tolerate, maybe because I sort of live in those circles. Yep. I, should, I should understand that objectively that that's their role as much as it's the role of a person who wields state power to be deceitful, but it's... The distinction is nevertheless there emotionally. Now, by commissar class, you were referring to the intellectual world or academia or the media, the, 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 a world uh, that you expect more from? I don't expect any more from them, and I never did. It's just that uh, uh, seeing what happens day after day in not all, of course, I don't want to exaggerate, but in large parts of the media and uh, in educated, respectable educated sectors rather generally, uh, that uh, strikes me as just appalling and intolerable. Though I recognize that that's an emotional reaction because I never expected anything else and I don't now either. In fact, if you look back at history, uh, you, you can go all the way to the earliest sources. This is the way it's always been. Say, to take the Bible, you know, the earliest literary source that we have, uh, and uh, consider the people who are now respected, the prophets. Well, they were then reviled. Uh, they were, uh, you know, imprisoned, uh, driven into the desert, hated, and so on, be in large part because of their, both because of their moral teachings and because of their geopolitical analysis. Uh, a large part of what they gave was uh, what we would today call a political or geopolitical analysis. They warned of the consequences of policies that were being taken. The people who were honored at that time were those who we now call false prophets. And I think that that uh, that that, that uh, th there are good reasons for that. Obviously, pandering to power will lead to uh, respect and authority and privilege, uh, uh, condemnation of uh, immorality, uh, of uh, the abuse of power, uh, of the destructiveness uh, for the general public, of uh, uh, the use of power. Uh, such policies will lead to uh, antagonism on the part of those who have the capacity to, uh, uh, to, to use violence or to organize masses against people who question their authority. That's obvious, and uh, the picture that you see in the Bible is uh, one that replicates itself over and over again in every society, including ours. I, I don't want to accuse you of presumption, but do you identify with these prophets in the Bible? No. No, I would say that this is true of every critical element in any society. Uh, I mention that because it's the classic example. How does the media do what it does? I mean, as, as the target of your critique, the hypocrisy of the media is a key subject. They, they claim to be gadflies, but you, you find that they, they work in a, in a blinkered and complicit way. How do they do that, and how does, how does it work so well? I should say, incidentally, that the media are not fundamentally different, in my opinion, from uh, a substantial part of scholarship and uh, uh, intellectual opinion. So, say, the journals of opinion and the uh, the uh, action, you know, the uh, operations of those who call themselves public intellectuals or whatever are not very different from the media. The media are a lot easier to study because there's a ton of material and you can look at it systematically and it's there day by day and so on. But what they bring out is not unique. Uh, how does it work? Well, they uh, they operate within a, gen in, in, rather generally, there, again, there are exceptions. These are, th these are overwhelmingly true generalizations, uh, I think. Uh, they operate within a framework of assumptions and understanding which are supportive of existing power structures which tend to exclude or uh, downplay or some, sometimes totally eliminate or even lie about uh, 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 actions of uh, 
domestic power, state and other power in our societies, that means corporate financial state power, uh, actions that are, that, they, that are conducted by these power centers that are uh, uh, inhuman, uh, violent, uh, uh, harmful to uh, 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 human values and human interests, those are marginalized and downplayed. And a picture of the world is presented that is conducive to and that tends to justify their uh, authority and their actions. Uh, in fact, if the institutions didn't behave that way, uh, they themselves would be uh, undermined and replaced by others that do. So, for example, if the New York Times, let's say, started telling the, the uh, truth about the world, uh, including uh, the truth about the uh, exercise of domestic power, uh, financial, corporate, and state power, uh, it uh, would not exist for very long. It, after all, is a major corporation selling a product to other businesses. It relies on its relations to the state for a good bit of its function, and this would be gone. Uh, also, if individuals entered into the, the major media uh, at high managerial positions, I include by that cultural managers like... Uh, editors and columnists and so on, uh, who did not, if, if, in, if, such individu if individuals moved into those positions who hadn't internalized those values, uh, they wouldn't last very long. Now, it's not that the people are lying. I think they're being honest but for the most part, but they get where they are because they've internalized values that are supportive to power. Although, on, you know, I, again, I don't want to say, claim that it's monolithic. So, for example, uh, the Boston Globe just ran an op-ed of mine a couple of weeks ago. And I have, you know, I have personal friends there, all the way up to the top editors over the years. So it's 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 a complicated country. It's, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's a, any you know any, any compli a simple description of any complicated system is going to be misleading. Uh, it is over. It, we happen to have a highly effective doctrinal system and a very narrow ideological spectrum, but there are exceptions. Uh, furthermore, it's widened over the years, in my opinion. So, for example, the media are considerably more open now, in my judgment, than they were, say, 30 years ago. Now, why do you think that is? I think it's because the country's changed. Uh, and when the country changes, its institutions change. So the, the public is far more critical and far more dissident uh, just by orders of magnitude than it was uh, 30 or 35 years ago. I, I mentioned a little while back that... Uh, the, even in the mid-60s, 1965 and 1966, in a liberal city like Boston, uh, public demonstrations, say, on the Boston Common, or even meetings in churches were simply physically attacked, often by students, incidentally, with the support of the media, liberal media in this city. Uh, that's an, an inconceivable today. In fact, uh, the the, uh, the 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 uh, attitudes and perceptions and understanding of the general population have changed radically on a whole host of issues. Well, well take take what's in some ways the most striking: the original sin of American society is uh, what the founding fathers were honest enough to call the extermination of the native population. Uh, that's uh, one which that's uh, the, the people like John Quincy Adams were pretty appalled by it, at least in his later years. But in American culture, that was really not recognized until the 1960s. I mean, when I was growing up, we played kids played cowboys and Indians. We were the cowboys, uh, and felt nothing of it uh, until the 1960s, when a major cultural change took place in the United States. There was no recognition of the horrifying atrocities uh, that uh, led to our living where we are and uh, 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 doing what we do. Uh, the fact that uh, the American Industrial Revolution, like the English Industrial Revolution, uh, was based on extermination of the native or expulsion of the native population in the United States and then uh, uh, in, you know, uh, enslaving masses of people, well, you know, to some, uh, certainly known in a certain sense, but it wasn't recognized as the major crime that it was. It's only since the 1960s that there has been, uh, even in scholarship, I should say, uh, a recognition of the enormity of what happened to the native population and a general uh, willingness to at least come to ter try to come to terms in some, some ways with that 
uh, extremely ugly aspect of our history. You could see it in 1992. Uh, it was assumed that uh, the quincentennial would be a celebration of uh, uh, you know, the uh, discovery and liberation of the hemisphere. Uh, that didn't happen, not at all. And it didn't happen because the public simply wouldn't tolerate it. Thirty years ago, that's exactly what it would have been. Well, those are, that's one aspect of, a, uh, of an improvement in moral values, of a, of a uh, cultural advance, uh, which is quite significant, shows up in many other ways with regard to uh, uh, feminist issues, ecological issues, uh, uh, solidarity with third world peoples, uh, many different respects. Multiculturalism is a case in point. All of these things have their, as in the case of any popular movement, there's going to be a fringe which is uh, unpleasant, ridiculous, uh, uh, maybe intolerable. But the main development is quite significant, I think, and it has affected the media as well. So the kinds of uh, um, the, the, the kinds of support for U.S. violence and terror uh, that would proceed without question in the 1960s, uh, m that you might find them in short bursts today, but they would be open to criticism in a sense, in a, in ma in a manner that was not true then. It's, it's, it's very nice to hear you talk this way after going, reading a lot of uh, very fiercely critical books of yours, of, mm -hmm. of, of American foreign Actually, policy. I point this out all the time. I mean, I don't put it, you know, I don't put it in headlines. But I know, it's there I know, somewhere. I know, I know. Yeah. That's true, yeah. too. That's true. <laughs> The Chomskyan revolution in linguistics suggests that we're born with this linguistic silver spoon in our mouths, the capacity to acquire language, that nature has given us this head start on language. It also does seem to go beyond language. It seems that at heart a more democratic, a more optimistic view of humankind. Is could, it? could come out of it. Uh, you can, I, I don't want to push it too hard because when you get beyond language and you know some aspects of vision and a few other things, uh, real scientific knowledge begins to drop off very fast. And we're back in the area where we started at the beginning, uh, looking at literature and history and experience and intuition and so on. But it can be used as the basis for a rather optimistic view, and indeed was. If we go back to the, uh, to the Enlightenment again, uh, these con connections of this kind were in fact drawn. Uh, well, for example, by Humboldt and Rousseau, who I mentioned earlier, uh, who uh, developed a kind of an optimistic view of human nature, uh, the idea that uh, th that human nature is based on a what was later called an instinct for freedom, a, a drive to be free, creative, uh, outside, uh, free of external constraints, and so on, uh, and that indeed came from a. Uh, basically, Cartesian picture saying that some as that fundamental aspects of human nature, in particular human freedom, are simply beyond the outside the range of any mechanism. That at the core of human nature is what was called as far back as the 16th century uh, a uh, generative capacity, a capacity to create, to innovate, to construct from the resources of your own mind the principles on which your knowledge is based, and in fact to construct new thoughts, uh, to express new thoughts. Uh, the idea that the intelligence is a generative faculty in this sense uh, goes back at least to the late uh, uh, 16th century and was developed richly in the uh, Cartesian Revolution and later picked up by the Romantics and in the Enlightenment and entered into political theory uh, in this, in in a way which is rather natural, uh, though by no means proven, uh, the belief that at the core of human nature is this drive for self-fulfillment under conditions of free uh, action, uh, undertaken by oneself uh, and out of one's own volition. So, from the point of view of say Humboldt again, uh, the uh, uh, every person is at heart an artist, uh, and if they uh, act uh, a crafts a craftsman, let's say, who acts under his or her own volition, uh, is an artist. Uh, if the same craftsman does the same thing uh, under external control, uh, well, as Humboldt puts it, we may admire what he does, but we hate what he is. Did you have a lot of faith in in ordinary? common sense that people, if only they had all the information, would make the right decisions. 
And at the same time, you probably more than most of us have spent a lot of time scrutinizing uh, international atrocities, being aware of what goes on in the world uh, and, and looking at it when most of us, even if the information were available to us, don't really want to or are too preoccupied elsewhere with our daily lives to spend, to pay that kind of attention. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you know, how optimistic or pessimistic I or some other person is, is really not important. I mean, suppose that I were to believe that there's, let's say, 2% probability that uh, if people uh, f uh, are brought to see the actual facts of the world about them, then they'll act in a moral and humane way, uh, then I would devote myself to that 2%, and so would any reasonable person, to, to enhancing that 2% probability and seeing what can be done with it. Now, I happen to think it's a much, much greater than that. I should say, incidentally, that this kind of what, in my view, is uh, so, and what you describe as optimism about people's capacity to uh, act in decent, humane ways when they understand uh, the realities, that's shared by, by people in power almost universally. Uh, if you look through history, including or just today, you will very rarely, if ever, see a, uh, uh, say, a statesman or a, a leader of some sort turn to the public and say, look, uh, it would be in our interest to go slaughter those guys over there or to rob them or torture them or terrorize them. So therefore, let's do it. You never find that. Uh, what you find is an elaborate set of uh, rationalizations and excuses uh, and uh, quite elaborate uh, constructions developed by intellectuals, which make it appear as if robbing them and torturing them and killing them and so on is right and just. Well, why bother with that? Uh, unless you're afraid at some level of your consciousness that if people know the truth, they're not going to let you get away with it. Noam Chomsky, you've occasionally been chided by your friends for not coming up with enough positive alternatives, for not coming up with some revolutionary strategy to, to get at the root of problems. How do you respond to that? Is, uh, I mean, is that, part of mm -hmm. your, is that part of your job? Sure. I mean, to the extent that I... First of all, I don't think that anybody, certainly not me, is smart enough to plan in any detail a, a, a you know a perfect society or even a, a you know you know the, a society to show in detail how a society based on more humane commitments and uh, uh, and concern for human values would function. I think we can say a lot about what it would be like, but we can't spell it out in great detail. Furthermore, what it would be like, I think, is reasonably well understood and has been for, in, in some ways, for centuries. Uh, we would like to see a society in which people, in which we overcome coercive institutions. Uh, absolutist, unaccountable institutions should not be tolerated in our time. That means primarily the uh, uh, financial and corporate centers, which are basically totalitarian in character and are now transnational in scale, and the state powers that... Uh, uh, and, and by now larger than state powers that respond to their interests. And the same is true for structures of authority and domination down to the level of inside the family. Uh, those should be combated and overcome. Uh, we should work for uh, democratic control in communities, in workplaces, over investment decisions, uh, 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 eliminating uh, hierarchic uh, relations and relations of dominance among people and states and uh, ethnic groups and so on. Uh, all of that's understandable. I think you can go on to describe in greater detail how possibilities about how such freer and more democratic structures might, might function. But the real answers will come by experience and testing. We don't, nobody understands enough to, sp you couldn't spell out in detail in the mid uh, 18th century the, how a parliamentary democracy might work. You had to try it. The general ideas could be there, but you had to try them and explore them and uh, experiment with them and so on. And the same is true of uh, expansion of freedom and democracy and justice today. As for a revolutionary strategy, I've never heard of one. When I look over history, the only strategy I see is trying to educate yourself, to help others become educated, to learn from others, to uh, organize uh, uh, and to the extent that organization proceeds to uh, uh, 
take action to try to uh, relieve injustice, to uh, extend freedom and so on. Now, that action can take many different forms. So just in my own life, I've been involved in things ranging from direct resistance uh, to uh, giving talks or you know, taking part in meetings. And there, there, there are no further secrets as, as, long, as far as I'm aware. I mean, the problem is one of dedicating oneself, to the extent you can at least, nobody's a saint, to dedicating oneself to the tasks that uh, have to be undertaken. And, you know, we can see what they are. You used to draw parallels between the Soviet Union and the United States as two power blocks and, and the, in the Soviet Union, the, the dictatorship resorted to violence to maintain control and in the United States. It was more, as democracies do, relying more on propaganda. Since the breakup of the Soviet Union, do you see any... I, I know that what's confronting us now and to when we look in that direction is obviously not particularly positive, but do you take anything positive to come out of that? Well, the elimination of Soviet tyranny is a major step for human freedom. In fact, in my view, it's a great victory for socialism. Uh, contrary to the uh, propaganda of both of the great power blocks, the Western power block and the Eastern power, power block, contrary to their propaganda, the Soviet Union, from its first days, from the days when Lenin Trotsky took, Lenin and Trotsky took power, was militantly anti-socialist in every respect. They immediately destroyed the socialist institutions and understood what they were doing. It was done in principle. So there's a great, I think there's an opening for freedom. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, Soviet Union, the, or most of Eastern Europe, quite predictably in my opinion, is now being driven back to a third world level. Uh, to a large extent, that's what the, third, the Cold War was about. Uh, the uh, no part in, in an international society dominated by private capital and private power and its uh, uh, its state manifestations. No sector, the, a large part of the world is just a kind of a service area. The South or the Third World, or given one or another designation, former colonial world, and no part of it is permitted to be to, to pursue an independent path. Doesn't matter whether it's Grenada or you know or a sixth of the world. Uh, and to a large extent, the Cold War was fought about that. It really began in 1917 and 1918, as the better historians notice. Uh, okay, the West, the more powerful uh, 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 combatant won the war, uh, uh, meaning the rich and powerful sectors in the West won the war. The large part of the population in the West lost the war, in fact. Uh, the... Uh, uh, Eastern Europe, or large parts of it, is now returning to its third world origins, pretty much where it was back at the early part of this century. Uh, that means a very serious decline, uh, and it also means enrichment. Uh, remember, a third world society has sect typically, has uh, any of our dependencies, have sectors of great wealth and privilege, and Eastern Europe does as well. So take Russia, uh, the uh, uh, the economy is collapsing. People are suffering. UNESCO really re recently reported that uh, there's about an excess of, they estimate, about half a million deaths a year in the Soviet Union uh, since 1989 as a result of the collapse, including the neoliberal reforms that are imposed on them. On the other hand, they're selling more uh, Mercedes Benzes for $150,000 a shot than, in Moscow than in New York. And the people who are buying them are often the old uh, Communist Party leaders. There's what's sometimes called nomenclatura capitalism. Uh, they're the victors of the Cold War, not the people of Russia. Uh, large parts of Eastern Europe are returning to a kind of third world service role. That offers new weapons against uh, working people in the West. So General Motors or uh, um, Audi and so on can find workers in Eastern Europe at a fraction of the cost of uh, Western workers who are now being called upon by the business press to abandon what are called their luxurious lifestyles uh, and uh, uh, to uh, reduce them to, to become more competitive, meaning uh, to face the fact that it's easy to gain profits and power by uh, exploiting much cheaper labor in the East. Uh, now, when General Motors moves over to, say, Poland, they, of course, insist on, a, let's say, a 30 percent tariff protection or something of that kind, as VW does when it goes to the Czech Republic, uh, because they don't believe in free markets. They believe in free markets for the poor, not for the rich, state power and protection for the rich. 
Uh, but these are the consequences of the end of the Cold War, and sure, they're not pretty. On the other hand, there is the elimination of one of the worst systems of tyranny of human history, and that offers all sorts of possibilities of uh, liberation and new scope for uh, human spirit and human freedom. I'd like to thank you very much. Thanks again for, for taking the time and, and coming in. Thank you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Noam Chomsky in Boston. Many of Chomsky's books are published by Black Rose in Montreal. His 1988 CBC Massey lectures are available from Anansi Books. And the Chomsky Reader is available from Random House.